I can't switch it once it starts. Oh, you can't? Yes. Don't you want it to be flipped? Is it live? Does she have some? Yeah. Hey, this is Mike from Modern New Tech. Uh, we are learning, learning the uh, ropes of using YouTube Live, so uh, hopefully this is working and you're seeing everything. We're here at the Annapolis Spring Boat Show, uh, which this year is being held at the Bay Bridge Marina. It's really nice marina, super nice docks. If you're ever gonna come here, uh, the docks are really nice. I think we, we could easily say that. Um, we, uh, we have quite a few people here, um, some actual just visitors to the boat show that are still looking around on this boat, first time seeing it. Um, the reception has been really, uh, really strong, really positive. People are surprised by just how nicely it's built and how unique it is in the market. But uh, we have some reference, or some um, uh, some references here. We have uh, Tommy and Amy from Sailor Catamarans. We have Thomas and Terry. Um, <laughs> there's the crew right there. Standing by. Yeah, standing by for any questions. Um, Kim Madigan is a finance expert. She's on her way here. She was actually closing a deal. So she's on her way here and we may have someone from insurance that's going to be able to provide some answers on that, which I know that's a huge thing for everybody. So uh, we'll have you hold tight for a second and we'll see if we have any, uh, any questions coming in. And if not, then um, we have some questions that came in ahead of time and there's some other ones that uh, we've heard throughout the day that we're going to pass on uh, as well. So hang tight. Okay, we're back. Sorry. Um, so Sue is now connected onto it as well, so we can see if there's any questions. So we'll start off with that. If anybody has any questions right now they'd like to ask, go ahead and throw those into the comments, and we'll do our best to answer them, find the right person if we don't know the answer, which is entirely likely. Um, but in the meantime, we will go with uh, some of the questions that um, we came across earlier. And this was a good one for Tommy. I mean, Thomas. Is Thomas, Thomas. around? Actually, you might know the answer to this, too. Thomas. Oh, that's okay. All right, so the first one, thanks, Sue, um, is one of the questions I came across on one of the videos is that um, you have 3,000 watts of solar, and I'm kind of I'm aiming this question at uh, Terry. I'll walk over here. <laughs> All right, so we have, um, you have 3,000 watts of solar. You have a large battery bank. It's a 16-kilowatt-hour battery bank, which is awesome. Um, why would you also have the gen set? Because it's a it's an expensive upgrade, and it's uh, something you may not need if you have so much power. Oh, coming Thomas in. is here too. Okay, all right. okay. So the sun doesn't shine all the time. That would be my great, answer. Yeah, it's a great answer. So That's they're true. asking about why would we have a gen set with all this solar um, and battery to, bank? Yeah, strictly for backup to give us the independence that we need to go anywhere on the planet. Um, Jen said it was just a logical step for us. Cool. It's a backup. It's totally a backup. You know, we might we might not use it every day. We might only use it to top off the batteries, but um, knowing that it's there helps. So it kind of makes me wonder, what's a typical day? When does your battery bank get fully charged? Like the following day, does it normally get fully charged at some point from sun? Yeah, Norm this, well, the sun will. Yeah. 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 Normally, on an average day, we might drop down to seventy percent at night. We have the option of topping it off with the, the generator. Um, or the engines, right? Those will top it off too? Yeah, but we, technically, but, yeah, but, yeah, but yes. we don't usually use the engines if we don't have to. Good, but um, we don't, yeah. And when I said 70%, so we'll top it off at night, mm -hmm. uh, maybe with the generator if it's not already topped off. Like now, I think we're in the 90s, uh, at least with solar. Then in the morning, maybe down to 70%, we might charge it up for you know, a few minutes with the generator. Yeah, so but otherwise, on necessary. a clear day like this, the solar takes over. That's great. And charge back up by and the And I think the, the recommendation is like you should start your gen um, at 30 or 40%. Well, that's what we, we have so Thomas is comfortable with 70 yeah. so, <laughs> so that's when we started. But, but it's not required. No. Right? no, yeah. no, no. We have a question. Okay, we have a question coming in. How long can the air conditioning run on the batteries? That's a great question. I like that. So we had this question earlier. The AC, we haven't had to run a lot because we haven't been in super, super warm climates. We've been in Grenada, but it was cool. And the, the air flow through here is pretty good. But the um, we have run the heat, though, all night. Wow. It's the reverse. Which is the same thing, right? Just exactly. switching those directions. They're very efficient. You know, again, it might take it down to maybe 65% uh, uh, overnight. Wow. That's great. Yeah. It's nice to be able to have that option, that's for sure. 
because it's going to get hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a 10 to 12 hours, I think, is what the typically you yeah. can run yeah. to before it goes down. I think you have to you make sure you have a large enough uh, AC inverter to be able to do that. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Still AC, yeah. our AC power, AC yeah. air conditioning. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have two, 3,000 watt converter for 110, and then I think it's 3,000 watts for 220. Oh, that's how you, I remember you have AC of both 110 and 220 AC on both, yes. so that's yes. how you do it. Yeah. That's good. That's a good question that no one asked that we all want to answer to. Yes, I did. Um, all right, so another question that came up was how close to the wind can you sail? And I know there's conflicting answers depending if we talk to Thomas or Tommy. So maybe we should go to, Let's go to Tommy. Tommy on this one. <laughs> Buddy, how are you doing? So the question is, uh, going to weather, catamarans prefer going off the wind, typically. That's the design to go with the flow and go with the coconut trail. But if you are in a situation, you are sailing the weather, um, the vision has no problem getting in between 40 and 45 degrees. The closer to the wind, obviously, the slower the boat's going to go. Um, so if you crack off the 45 to 50, you're going to be sprinting the weather. You know, so. It's all about VMG. Velocity made good, exactly. right? So if you're going faster but at a further angle, right, it's a kind of a trig, uh, trig question. Um, and then another, th another one that was related to that was how did the boat perform in chop as you were coming across or just like, my guess is that it's gonna be different answer whether you're out at sea or whether you're close to land and it's kind of shorter period waves, but what are your, I guess, your thoughts on that? No, I mean, uh, the only place we kind of chop is coming up the East Coast and uh, I think in the Carolinas or Florida. Uh, That's our Coming fault. across the Atlantic, <laughs> there was very little chop. It was all following seas. It was, it was uh, really uneventful. Uh, as far as handling the chop, it's it's great. I mean, we, um, minimum slap. Um, I don't know. Can you say anything else? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah that's good. And then another question that came up was, what about what's hull speed? What were you kind of experiencing when you're crossing, as far as like actual s speed the from average. just using the sails? Yeah, maybe we'll maybe not average like during your whole transit, but what was the what was the typical speed speed you'd be able to get up to if you had decent wind? I think on a spinnaker we averaged uh, eight to nine knots. Okay. Uh, if we had the motor, six yeah. and a half, seven knots. One engine. Um, one, one engine. engine. We generally try to you yeah. know, low RPMs. Yeah. We generally try to, to alternate the motors so we keep the hours even. Um, maximum probably 14, 15 knots. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, it's just it's such a light boat that it's very easy, and we also go very conservative. I mean, for, for example, between St. Lucia and U.S. Virgin Islands, 42 hours it normally takes three days, and we had two reefs in the main and our, our jib, um, and it, it performed, you know, beautifully. How long did it take? Us? 42 hours. Oh. Normally it's a three-day passage. Oh, it's great. Cool. All right, so we did have some questions on insurance, and our insurance and our finance people are, are still on their way there. I don't know if there's any other questions that anybody else has. Anybody, how about any of the questions that you've come across a lot today? Because it's been a busy day. Yeah. I think there was one more, um, one more sailmate, right? Or someone that put a deposit down. Yes. So that's exciting. Yep. Congratulations yep. again. You guys have had well, an amazing success. Here comes the insurance scale now. Oh, there it comes. <laughs> oh, while well, they, well, they get settled in, there is one more question that just came in um, that does relate to the... the Passage. Um, how many gallons of diesel per hour do you use if, mo if well, motoring? That's a great question. Yeah, great question. That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you. Uh, <laughs> he's, is, he's this gonna do some math. is this for Tommy? <laughs> he's going to do some math. He's gone 9,000 miles on this period. He better give us the answer. You know, <laughs> we filled up with uh, 14 jerry cans just to ensure. So we had two tanks, which are nine, uh, 80 gallons each. And then 14 gallons of 25 here. liters each, and we had just enough to make it to Grenada. Wow! Yeah. So uh, it's a, the two nannies that we have are 38 horsepower, very efficient. As far as the consumption, I'll have to get back with you. Yeah, yeah. we'll we'll, uh, we'll follow up with an answer to that because that is a really good question. That yeah. is something that people would want to know what, what kind of range you can get out of full tank. Yeah. So. It's somewhere less than 9,000. You know, it's less than 9,000 miles. Probably it's probably mass, over 100. Less, so yeah. it's, it's somewhere in that range. So, I mean, if you need more detail than that, I don't know what to tell you. Now, we'll get back to anybody that has. To give you an example, uh, from 
West Palm Beach to Annapolis, uh, we filled up two, two tanks and we motored probably three quarters of the way because there just wasn't any wind. And that's probably 500 nautical miles ish? Yeah. 500, yeah, 550 miles. Okay. And it, uh, so 80, 160 gallons approximately. Okay. So that's uh, around two and a half miles a gallon. Does that uh, sound right? And you were going at about six, six and a half knots? knots, seven knots, yeah. So we'll, we'll get the answer. One of you that's yes. not on camera right now can probably do that math more than I can do in my <laughs> head without trying to think about it too much. Um, but that uh, that gives that's good data. That probably we could probably get yes. to the bottom of that about what the burn rate Someone is. Also, we also have right burn right chart. <laughs> Nanny produces, you know, like a. a Consumption chart. Yes. Consumption chart. Okay. Exactly. I'll get that to you. Okay, great. We'll put that up on our blog yes. as well because I know there. I just put up on the blog if anyone's interested. The the uh, the blog is just on a new tack.com. If you go there, I just put a post up recently that was kind of some follow up to some of the questions that came up in our review videos. So there is the polar chart that was given to that was sent to me by Vision, and there's also the standard inventory, what comes on the boat when you when someone purchases it. So you can take a look at both of those if you're interested in it, and I believe there's a way to ask questions there. You can also ask on any of these videos, and I'll get back to any questions that come up. Um, so we have Kim Madigan here. No. No, I'm sorry. We have Liz jo Oh, good, because I was like, that doesn't remind me of the person I met before. That went by the name of Kim. So Liz is the finance expert. No, 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 Liz. I'm sorry. Liz is the insurance expert. Liz is the insurance expert. I'm gonna look good so, at yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Try to set the stage, right? You can be a complete bumbling idiot and you do just fine. So um, she's gonna get up and leave. All right. So Liz sells cars. Um, no, so Liz, want to introduce yourself and your company? Uh, well, I'm Liz Childs with Mark Green Insurance, and we do yacht insurance. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we haven't met in person yet, so Mike and Sue, uh, we have a YouTube channel on, on a new tag. And we're on live. And we're, yeah. we're doing YouTube live, and we're trying okay. to just come up with some questions that, that have, we've heard today, and have some people have asked me uh, offline via email. Um, and insurance is, boat insurance, it seems like it's this big black hole of answers that depends on every little bit of minutia of detail that goes right. into it. So. Um, if you want to give any more kind of insight into that, just generally we can start with that, or if you want me to go into some of the questions I think we've the seen. the questions are best because there's so many different variations and sure. so many different navigation areas, and people, are, their, their intentions are totally different. Chesapeake Bay, Caribbean, I mean, it's just, it's, it, again, it's a lot of variables that are put into, you know, whether you can get the insurance, if it's going to be hard to find. Um, so why don't we go with the questions, sure. and then we can go from there. That sounds good. All right, so um, what a lot of people have seen, noticed, is that it, the insurance is just, the market changes dr dramatically from one year, one season to the next. Um, and it can be very difficult to get insurance. So um, I guess the first one will be, what are suggestions that can make the process easier for someone that's trying to get insurance? Uh, I think resumes up front also help. Uh, the big problem lately has been people are buying bigger boats and they're taking over a 15 foot jump. Yeah. And that is something the uh, carriers are not interested in. So if you do have a really good resume but no prior boat ownership, that, that would help. A lot. And this is not like a resume that says you're good at Excel or you've worked at, yeah, uh, or, this is more know, of a sailing I grew resume. Up on my father's 16 foot hubby cat. No, okay. It what, is, you what know, you've adult, sailed, where adult you've been. motoring and any chartering you've done, any you know courses you've taken, certifications, family owned boats, deliveries. You know, just something like that would help a lot. Okay, interesting. That's good. That's something that people can work on because there's actually a bunch of resources for people that want to get sailing experience and help crew on other boats. There's some great websites that can help you do that if you want to build your resume that way. Um, all right, another one is um, what aspects of, you know, someone trying to get coverage make the most difference in being able to get coverage or get coverage that's at a reasonable price? Like, what are the big ones that, are like, oh, you want to do that? Well, then get out your gold bars or yeah it would be buying a boat again having a prior boat ownership a lot of these people are now jumping into big boats you know without with having, nothing yeah. yeah and it's just not working and now with all the other insurance companies that have pulled out I think the current carriers are getting a little picky of who they're taking mm -hmm. so you know years ago you could do that in a heartbeat but they're not looking at it like that anymore they're now you know 
just the client if uh -huh. you are, you know, without prior vote ownership. So, you know, buy, don't buy big necessarily. Buy something within reason, keep it for a year, and then make your move. Interesting, okay. That's Liz, can I just add to this? I mean, obviously the location, if you're going to be in the hurricane belt, is going to make a big difference than if you're outside of the hurricane belt. With well, the that's a, like a different question, I think, yeah. because that is another big thing. You know, first we have to find out, um, can these people get insurance? And then the next question is, okay, now where are you keeping them? Are you going to be in the Caribbean during hurricane season, Florida during hurricane season? And a lot of uh, the market is pulled out of that. Interesting. So, so there's only a few left. And then also chartering. Then you add charter to it, and that's another complication. Bare boat charters have been somewhat difficult recently, uh, but some new carriers have pulled in. They are doing bare boat charter, and I don't have a feel for their appetite yet, but I do get the impression they're doing it case by case. Okay. And who is in charge of the boat, and who's in charge of the chart? You know, they're not just letting Joe Schmo fleet, who just started, you know, in the Bahamas, you know, be in charge of it. They want to know who is like responsible for the boat, who's vetting mm -hmm. the charterers, yeah, that and makes it's going difference. to be a big process now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, and then if um, if if those things kind of play into the insurance price, um, so you have experience, which is w within your control. You have where you're going to sail, which for a lot of people, like, okay, if I can't afford to get insurance to sail here, or I can't get coverage in this area, then I'll just change my my plan of where I want to be. Um, is there other things? Does the boat maker have any difference? Does the age of the boat have any difference on kind of the coverage? Um, age, yeah, age is a big factor now because these fiberglass boats are lasting a lot longer. And uh, one of the main carriers that did a lot of the boats over 50 years old just reduced it down to no more boats over 40 years. Interesting. Yeah, and no more catamarans over 15 years. Wow. Sail cats. So that's gonna that's gonna affect a lot of people. Um, today I inquired, and it sounds like they're going to be grandfathered in, but moving forward they're not doing it. So these older boats are going to struggle finding insurance. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's good news for uh, sail away catamarans. <laughs> I knew. You <laughs> Don't get me wrong. There are carriers out there that will do it, but they'll want to see a very clean survey. The wooden boats are going to have a struggle. If it's a classic boat or, you know, like a historic boat, then there are some associations that do offer insurance for them. Okay. But, you know, it is... Is you know as these boats get older, it's going to get harder and harder. That makes sense, um, and unfortunate for a lot of people that may have a boat that they think they can do more with it. They really and they really can do. Um, that was actually the next question on here, so you did that ahead of time. That's great. Um, uh, a lot of people that have reached out have uh, plans of being a liveaboard versus using it on occasion. How does that impact um, the rates or the availability of insurance? If someone's going to be like, well, I'm going to use it on the weekends, or I'm going to use it. 20, 30 days a year versus it's going to be my home. Yeah. Uh, living boards sometimes have gotten, I think, a bad rap, uh, and some don't do them, but it, there's a difference between full-time cruisers and living boards. There's a living board that sits at Gangplank Marina and does not move. So they basically have a, an apartment that's tied up that, to a dock. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Dock gotcha. potatoes. <laughs> so those are the ones I, I think they're not interested in. But full-time full cruisers, they want you with the boat. You're cruising around and you're on the boat and you're taking care of your boat. And, you know, the, that's the big difference between full, you know, little boats. I gotcha. That yeah. makes sense. And I, I would assume that the, the boat in question probably is going to make a big difference in the cruising range of someone's... Yeah, the variations, um, again, are mm -hmm. huge and all depending on, you know... I mean, some people are liveaboards, but they still have a residence somewhere, so they still have their personal liability. They're not giving that up. Mm -hmm. So that makes a big difference. And there are some policies out there, if you are a full-time cruiser, they will offer you the personal liability if you give up your home. Okay. So, again, another variation to, you know, check into. Sure. So, um, what is, uh, I know that the, well, I've been told that the insurance has a lot to do with, uh, a lot of times it's a percentage of the whole value. Or it relates to the first, like the, the cost, the premium. You can say, well, we can estimate it's going to be about X percent of what the boat value. It used is. to be a one percent, two percent of the hull value, but mm -hmm. that's changed. Now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's it, depending on your experience, mm -hmm. where you're keeping the boat during the summer months. That's huge, mm -hmm. and how much liability you want, mm -hmm. and again, your experience is another you know factor too. So, okay, so it's not necessarily tied to the hull value as much anymore, but is there a range that someone could use as a guideline to know? Well, it would be hard because if you're keeping your boat in Florida full time year round, mm -hmm. that's one rate. If you take your boat up to the Chesapeake during the summer months, you're going to have your premiums going to be high. 
Oh, okay. So it could so, be like you might be at five percent if you're in the yeah. hurricane zone through the went through the right. hurricane months. Yeah. And your deductibles make a big difference too. So oh, okay. one percent or a two percent, and then you have your name storm deductibles, which are assigned to you, so you don't really have a choice in that. I see. Interesting. What's the? Um, I don't. That's all the questions I had that were kind of leading into this. Unless we have any that come in, we'll certainly answer those as well. Um, but what is the something that maybe we didn't touch on yet? What is the maybe the one surprising factor that people don't? appreciate when they're looking for insurance as a first-time boat insurance buyer? Uh, well, depending on where they're keeping the boat, the name storm deductibles are, you know, up there now. They go from 5% to 20%. And can you explain, because I'm sure there's some, some viewers that may not understand what that means. Can you maybe summarize what that means? Well, your deductible would be based upon your hull value. So a standard deductible would be 1% to 2%, and that's uh, financing permits that, and that's good. But when you get into the name storm deductibles or windstorm deductibles, which obviously is going to be damage caused by any storm, then your deductible goes up to 5%, 10%, possibly 20%, depending on the carrier. Okay, so basically, to maybe put it in, in, in like, uh, re me restating it, if you're in an area and a name storm comes up and causes damage to your boat, and you're like, well, the Michael, the storm Michael, which sounds like it would be a terrible storm, uh, <laughs> created damage to your boat, then your deductible is now not 1%, it's X percent, 10%, whatever the number is. Correct. Is that a right? Depending on what the declaration page says, that is it. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and they're, sometimes they're not limited to certain areas or certain time frames. Geico, is, for example, they have a 5% uh, windstorm deductible, name storm deductible, and that applies year-round, all everywhere. So that's it's typical no, it's gecko not just bullshit. Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we have a question or a comment and question from Robin. She likes the solar panel setup. She wants to know about their experience flipping up the panels when underway, and also how many MPPT controllers are they using with the panels? Great question. Thank you. I'll let. Uh, <laughs> would you like to be the really? answer? <laughs> controllers meaning. Um... So the MPPT controller is what each panel. Well, it's what takes in, uh, solar energy and converts it into being able to charge a battery, and. Normally, you want to, if you have, the more you have, you could have a solar cell covered and it would still provide charge to the batteries. We have one per solar panel. Per panel. Yes. Which I think is the ideal. Yes. Because yes, that yes. way, if you have coverage, if one's completely shaded, you're yes, still getting eight. all the benefit from the other one. Is that? Yes. Eight. Yeah. So, eight on this boat. And because there's eight what panels. What was the other question? Um, experience flipping them when underway. Oh, well, they're, they're super easy. Do you get underway push? and chop and everything? Oh, well, I haven't done an underway and chop. If you were I mean, in 49 because winds. Because we have a, no. a, a main for, uh, a, um, boom puller. That's a really good point. It's a good you question. You don't have to get up there when you're in chop. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't have to. But. It's a good question, but it's more like it doesn't matter. Right? Yeah. It's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. It's because you, you just don't go up there then because why would you? The only time I can see is if there's like maybe hail coming. Yeah. And you want to protect the panels. And when I just close them, yeah. yeah. But they're, they're push button, flip over, and they're really easy to, to manage. I think the goal would be to, if you know you're going to be traveling or... Yeah, or you, you prepare. You, you prepare you, yeah. and you move it, move them aside. So if you, if there's a possibility that you might need to reach the boom, yeah. you would want to flip them over and move it aside so you can... Night like, pass. Yeah, 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 if you're going to do a night yeah. passage, it would probably be a good, like, safe maneuver sure. to do just because, like, well, I can do it now because I can, I can see. And then that way they're out of the way and... The solar panels, they want to sleep anyways. Right? They don't need to be out right. during, at night. Exactly. So, yeah. Anything else? Um, we do have a couple more. Robin had another uh, question. She said she was really impressed with the displacement at 9 tons, a lot lighter than the Sea Wind 1370 at 11 tons, and a lot lighter than a charter boat like the Leopard 45. At 18 tons. <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. wants to know how, how they in achieve that impressive weight spec. It's a lot of helium. <laughs> no, it's actually, um, what I've been told is uh, the, the construction method is vinyl ester, so it's a foam core, fiberglass on both sides of that foam core. The cabinetry um, is made with a, a composite material that is very lightweight, and you have an actual wood veneer on the out, all the outside edges of it, but, um, so Sue and I own a cabinet shop, and melamine is what is used by a lot of production catamarans. It's a, it's a very durable surface, actually. It gets a bad rep, but the outside of melamine is very durable, but it's usually on a particle board core, uh, which is available in different grades. Um, and I'm sure they're using a fine grade, but at the end of the day, it's a he very heavy product. Um, there's a lot of good things about, um, about melamine panels with, on particle board core, but not when weight is important. 
so when you have a material like this, there's, there's actually, you know, if you think about all the wooden panels in a boat, there's a lot, they add up. So I think that's probably the there's main contributor. Yes. Yeah, there's other things I have. Yeah, uh, Just the way the boat's manufactured. Foam. And so in the structural areas, they're, they're solid fiberglass, like, there's no modular line. furniture on board this boat. It's all everything here is part of the boat. Right. All the it's cabinetry. It's all built in, glassed in. Which is which is There's great because you get those creaks and stuff too, right? Exactly. There's not not Makes creaks and all that. Very quiet. Yeah. Yeah. It's loudest when Tommy's on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be. We do have another insurance question. Cool. Okay. Is there different insurance based on where you sail? For example, distance from the shore or leaving U.S. territory. Is there a different insurance based on where you sail? For example, distance from shore or leaving the U.S. territory? Do you have a different type of insurance you have to get? Um, or the, pretty car, much, or the cost can be yeah, different? Yeah, it depends on the carrier. Some carriers will only do U.S. waters, and if you go international, you would then have to switch. So what we do a lot of, um, you know, there are some carriers that will do the Bahamas, the U.S. carriers, and some of Mexico. But pretty much anything deeper than that, we would have to probably go to a surplus line. Thank you. Tommy has a question. Thomas. Thomas has a question. <laughs> uh, Liz, a letter of competence from a captain, is that a re uh, does that help our insurance rates? We get, uh, Again, of depending on the carrier, right. some will do that training endorsement and then remove it once you have a letter signed off by an approved right. captain. Uh, not so much anymore. Pretty much now they, for a full year, you have to have a approved captain on board running the boat. Oh, yeah. For yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and a lot of times that would be Tommy or somebody within our company, you know, right. like he would be the approved captain within the insurance company and then and then he can sign you off. That would be offshore or even in the Chesapeake? Anywhere. It's up to the captain's discretion of where, you know, he feels you're competent yeah. of running the boat. So. Well, I mean, as far as the insurance company, would, would they consider us uh, liable legal operators? in the Chesapeake, but not offshore, we would have to have as a uh, captain, a uh, company captain on board, or? Well, when you're signed off, and they, they yeah, depending on your navigation, if you were in the continental U.S., they're probably fine with it, okay. but if you then go to extend your navigation, and you say, your file, and yeah. say, well, you know, you were, you know, signed off on, but we're not sure you're ready for blue water. Okay. So a lot of them would then say, okay, we want to see who's going to be on board the boat during your blue water crossings. They want three competent, experienced people on board that have done that. Again, depending on the carrier, you know, some of those are some of the stipulations. Yeah. This is why you need Liz or somebody like her to yeah. navigate these insurance waters because it's complicated yeah so we will put um, Liz's information at the bottom of this uh, this is gonna be saved uh, YouTube live video so you'll be able to come back and refer to it we'll put her contact information there and, and I think all this is going to I think the big takeaway for me is you have to it, it depends on your situation and what you're planning on doing and all those kind of things so I think it just makes sense to get yourself uh, in the hands of someone that, um, that is an expert in the field and they can uh, address those. So you work with how many different carriers do you say you work with at the moment? We probably have about 10, okay. um, you know, for a lot of, or for smaller boats, mm -hmm. but we also do with the surplus line dealers, and I just have appointments and access to other carriers that I personally am not hooked up with more experience, but, but you're right, it's like a pyramid, it's like a building block. We have to, you know, what do you need, what are you getting, and then we put it together and shoot you to the carrier we think that's going to be able to accommodate you. And it sounds like it might be back and forth, right? If you the first plan is like, well, that we're not that's not affordable. Yeah. Then a lot of people change the cruising and, plans once yeah. they figure out the cost. Yeah. You know, and you know, being in the Caribbean during. No, it seems like it's well. A lot of them idea. are now not here. They're not um, offering windstorm protection. So at all, yeah. just basically, so yeah. you're on your own. Your basic point. policy: if you're damaged by a name storm, no coverage. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Which man? kind of get Understand. especially how many losses there have been in recent years mm -hmm. just catastrophic losses because those name storms came over where there were so many charter bases oh, yeah. it was devastating mm -hmm. a lot of boats so, so okay um any other questions the only there's a little bit of clarification on the foldable solar panels um <laughs> is this unique to this boat and is is there any yes. drawback yes. to this type of mounting when you are underway I think it was um, 
Thomas, why don't you share your experience? But it is unique because it's very negative. It's false. No drawbacks. No drawbacks. So we, we elected to put it we could and we came up with eight. And they're hinged. And there's basically one that we have to move to get access to the boom. So there are no drawbacks um, to I've been uh, encountered. Is there an easy um, one we can get to and you can show us yeah. the process? Show them the, show them the, yeah. Since Sue's yeah. mobile. It's very easy. Go right yeah, over to this side, Thomas. Maybe we should talk about why we don't use the... You want to go up here? You a water pump. Why don't you show us on um, on one of the ones that's easy to get to? It doesn't have to be any particular one. And we're going to try to talk uh, loud as possible because it's pretty windy. If I go back and look at this and it can't be heard, I'll add some transcripts. So there's a little push button to disconnect that uh, post from the plate. And now uh, Thomas is getting the second one. There we go. There you go. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Like Thank said, you, Jack. For maintenance, usually we have to move one. Rarely move the other ones. So uh, he said he normally just has to move one to be able to get to the boom, and that's about it. Um, but they all kind of pivot one direction or the other. So yeah, that's great. Okay, so I see some more questions. Um, is the engine sail drive or skeg hung? It is sail drive. I'm 99% positive. It's sail drive. Yeah, he's confirming it's sail drive. We'll uh, walk back. I'm gonna walk forwards. What else we got? Um, there was a question if the windows were glass or plastic. Great question. They are glass, which was actually made me, uh, I was kind of excited to see that. And I will take you to show you that. So there are the windows. They are actual glass. Super, super thick. Flat glass. Flat glass. Yeah, they're perfectly flat. They don't have a curve to them. They're not anything goofy. Uh, and then two of them have the hatches mounted into them. These are going to be a little bit bigger, I think, in the next Oh, really? That's neat. Um, I don't know that we want to talk about some of the new changes. Like they're going to put a cabinet up here and um, modify this a little bit in the galley. Cool. Um, this is right over here. I see a question. I'll come back to some of the other ones, but I see a question from my buddy Ray Henry that I used to work with. Um, did we talk about the robustness of the large hatches along the walkway sides? We didn't talk about them, but I, I talked to Ray about this. Ray saw my videos and he goes, how strong are those? Because they're big hatches what's the chance of damaging them cracking them you know they're how strong are they because the ones in the let me show actually because they're they're large so that you can get the engines out through that hatch the one the, the two the biggest ones are the biggest ones yeah, i'm going to show are a little bit smaller. i'll show in the yeah. cabin that's probably easiest so yeah. we'll get into the cabin here just so you can see exactly how all oh, the engines open on the side which if you haven't seen that yet there you go i'll go to the other <laughs> side <laughs> i'm gonna go into this side because the engines open yeah. over there all right, we are now on starboard. So there's the hatch above the main bed. Um, it's, I don't know the exact size. My guess looking at it is about, it's about 24 inches, maybe 22 inches wide. So the actual question though. Pull it right up. So the question is, what are the, do you know what they're rated for? Can you stand on them? Do you have to worry about them well, getting damaged? You can stand on them, but like any slick surface, it's wise not to. Right. There's no non-skid on so, it. So the one thing that we learned about those hatches, um, and we learned this while we were in Grenada, yes, you can walk on them, but the corners are susceptible to break it. Oh, okay. If you're wearing like lineman boots, if you've got a technician walking on them. So what people are doing are putting little uh, like rubbers, rubbers, rubbers oh, underneath the, the corners. Cool. Uh, to support them. 
but otherwise they're fine. They're I'm going to show what uh, Thomas is talking about because if you haven't looked at these hatches up close, it may not make any the comment was that he what he heard was that these corners here right where it's not supported you have kind of like this this outrigger solution um position or a situation if you put a bumper underneath there that goes between is, is the right side that provides the support that um kind of strengthens up that that one weak spot so another question that came up this will be for uh thomas and terry they will be able to answer this perfectly so one other question came across, is there any diesel smell in the not a, not, a, not, not a bit, not anything, nothing, nothing. There's just the, the, the smell of uh, living on a, of, uh, of retirement, the ocean, right? The diesel smell. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there's That's extractor strange. fans in there. Yeah. Oh, but even without the extractor fans, when you have it open, there, you really don't sense any diesel smell. Yeah. So yeah. Only when you're there changing the filters, you know, what happened. During yeah. operation. And filling it, I know the tanks are center yes, right, 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 right in front of the mast. What's happening? Like, is that easy to do? Or yeah, I yeah. guess most hoses are pretty long. They are. Most yeah. docks. You just have to docks. notify the, the, the dock personnel because they have, on occasion, you know, thought that it was at the back of the oh. boat. So we just tell them it's at the front. And yeah. it's not, like and not only that, Thomas, the deck fills aren't on the deck. They're actually inside the locker yes. on top yes. of the tank. So exactly. any chance of rainwater or ocean water penetrating. Uh, the tanks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta be We had that issue. We had that issue. <laughs> we lost two engines coming over uh, because that little washer inside the. Well, thing it's a uh, fifty really? cent gasket that dries, dry rots, cracks and breaks and flattens out. Yeah. It's no longer water, water tight right. fitting. So yeah, we filled our fill tanks up with rainwater <laughs> and ocean water. Nice. Any other questions that have come across? Um, Scott Magoon asked if there were any financing options for a boat like this, so I don't know if we can answer that until the... We can. Amy can support that. I, okay. I, can, uh, I am not a finance person by any means, but um, I can tell you that, um, you know, right now, basically there, there are about four build payments for, for this particular boat. Um, um, you pretty much have to come up with the first three in the deposit and then the finance company can step in and can um, you know pay that last bill payment and also uh, refund your money and you typically would have to have to pay for 20 percent at the end so you'd have to have 20 percent invested well, you'd I mean, have to have the full money up front to basically or most of it to get the boat right. in your name and then uh, and then once that happens the, the lender can pay you all back but I guess pay you all back except for 20% which would be like your, exactly. your ownership your 20% exactly the down payments like if you're thinking about right. it in terms of a home thanks right. on doing build right. payments no construction loans so you don't get a construction loan like you would have in a house build mainly because you can't go over easily to South Africa or France or wherever else right. uh, there's a good change for us though we've been approached and we're talking to individuals where possibly can do some construction loans yeah that's good, We're hoping good for that a future, in the future conversation, yeah. Um, so I know some of the people that I've been talking to here, is like, but they'll we get a home equity loan to pay for it up front and then use that to, uh, yeah, to get mean, themselves off the ground. Yeah, most financial institution or, or uh, brokers will, will help you find ways to take your own money and then pay yourself back, like a, like a HELOC or... Um, maybe uh, some way borrow from your retirement fund oh, yeah, and, then pay it, and then pay it back. So yeah. that's what they're here to help you do. Okay. And Kim Madigan is trying to get here. She was working on an actual closing for someone. So she's on her way here. She is the right person to ask these two because yes. that's her value. Not me. Yeah. We can also include her information. Yeah, we'll put her yeah. information at the bottom. Anyone can follow up afterwards and get any of those questions answered if she doesn't get a chance to make it here. Um, she may have gotten held up at security. They may have just oh. taken one off. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Robin had another question. She was wondering if someone could um, talk a little bit about the steering mechanicals and the helm feel. Tell me. Right, well, now, so right now, in regards to the steering, this boat has got hydraulic steering. Um, okay. A whole number of mechanical setup 
it's more um, rod and and rack and pinion style, M multiple junctions making it to the quadrant. You have one side that is uh, the master, and there's a rod over to the other rudder post. Um, so we're we're doing some changes on on that as we speak. So no more hydraulic steering for the vision. So that will make half, you'll have better feel of what exactly. the feedback yes. you're getting. You're going to get kind of resistance on it. We have a, a hydraulic yes. on our boat, and there's some things that are very nice about it. Um, like one thing that's kind of neat is once you put the auto helm on, you can just spin that wheel to sure. hold your heart's content. It's, it doesn't like move, and you can stick your hand through the wheel to get to the chart plotter. But now this is going to be directly tied to it, so the wheel's always going to move. Exactly. But the one of the nice things is that if you have your dead center tape marked or something, you know when you're there. I mean, I think there's probably an indicator too, this right, for yeah. rudder position. The, the slight yeah. drawback with hydraulic, though, in time, um, the rudders get out of sync. Mm. But there is a quick fix to that. Um, we've got a solution. Um, and there's just a bit of turning the wheels and, and adjusting the pressure. Adjusting the pressure. Oh, really? Line up. Oh, so there's, is there two hydraulic pistons? Hydraulic. Yeah. One for each side? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, oh so there's no crazy. linkage right now? No. Oh, interesting. I have no, I have no idea. And maybe maybe Thomas can talk to the helm feel. Oh, helm feel? How does it feel? Helm, I mean, for me, it feels fine. I mean, you know, again, I, I have limited, you know, I can't compare it with a lot of uh, uh, different helms, but um, very comfortable with it. Um, once you get your confidence on the boat, it's, it feels like a dream. Yeah. Cool. It's quite happy with it. feeling. Yeah. It feels, I mean, it feels like a steering wheel. If there's, it's, it responds. You know, so, yeah. From my limited experience, <laughs> you know, comparing it to a car, <laughs> it's very natural. You know, it's it's it's, it's good. Um, and then Robin also asked if are we, how much performance are you giving up um, with a with a roller furling boom versus a tra traditional large rope square top? That's a good question. I've looked. At at that, I was curious about that as well, um, and I don't know the actual answer. We can try to get a follow-up answer unless someone else chimes in. Uh, I you wouldn't know the difference. I don't think you know the difference. You, you can't have the... Um, um, you wouldn't know the difference. I think on the... Uh, Bentons. Bentons. You can't have Bentons in a, in a but other, other than that... You can't have Bentons in a, in a mask, is that what you're saying? Yeah, you can have Bentons. So if you wanted to have like a square capsule or something, you can't that right with, with the in the roller so you're not losing a lot it's just whatever that might provide gotcha yeah so uh, a lot of the like south other south african builders or the big builders they'll put the square top mainsail on which looks really cool and you get a little bit more performance out of it but it is pretty small but you have um, and i've been on a leopard 45 and you have a pretty non-simple mechanism that is involved in pulling up that last bit of the square top and there's a lot of strain on that because we actually had an issue when we were helping friends deliver a Leopard 45. There's this really thick, like three eighths inch thick piece of Dyneema that pulls up that last piece. And we like we ripped the shackle off of the sail because something was bound up. Well, so there's you know, what are we losing performance wise? And not losing hardly anything, but what you gain by doing the in yeah, roller exactly. furling, that's the bigger gain. The convenience. Yeah. Um, well, you've the eliminated safety. the need for lazy jacks, eliminated the need for um, sail bag. There's no um, reefing lines. So it's a really clean finish. And if once you get familiar with the way your in-boom roller filling operates, it's no different than your roller filling head sail. One's horizontal, one's vertical. Except one's not trapped in a mast like on our boat where when it binds, you want to just sink it. <laughs> yeah. You know, in-boom roller filling, technology has come a long way and it's not so much the furling systems change it's all the components associated with it like now there's dyneema or spectral lines that don't stretch mm -hmm. 20 years ago they didn't have that technology right it's different today than it was 20 years ago when leisure furl was just coming into play if anybody has any specific questions about what the mechanism looks like put that in the comments and we'll take you up there i don't want to just go on a, on a walk for to bore people so if there's something you want to see let me know or let us know is there an emergency tiller setup? Yes, yes there is. Manual, yeah. On both sides, we have a, uh, two separate uh, arms that we can use to uh, adjust the, the rudders appropriately. Is, you think that'll go to one emergency tiller if there's linkage? 
There would be. Mm -hmm. Actually, is it one? Mm -hmm. Is there here important? No, it's two right now. It's two now because you have hydraulic. Yeah. There's a, but there's a once it goes to manual, right? But two. when we go, the question was when we go with the new yeah. steering then system, those will be one. one. Yeah. One set up. And your linkage is not allowed to fail, which I mean it shouldn't. It's not really doing much. You know the builder. I mean, look, this is one manufacturer that's truly building the boat for a cruising couple, mm -hmm. blue water adventurers, and. Uh, He's a sailor himself. Yeah, so we're trying to make a, a non-complicated vessel here, built extremely well, and have fun sailing at the same time. Bring mm -hmm. in the blue water performance style cruising. Great. So Kim, Kim is here. Yeah. If anyone has any questions about financing. Well, so we'll come, we're gonna, so just gonna answer a question, but this is Kim Madigan, you are with? New Coast Financial, uh, Kim Madigan. And we'll, we'll come back in a second. I have sure. some written questions, but we'll see if anyone has any specific questions. And then we'll take Amy off the hook for answering financial questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to prove Sorry. everyone and tell them the right window. She's just, she's <laughs> everyone's I approved. Says, <laughs> right, Trump says exactly. whatever I say. Damage control. Yeah. Well, Kim, Kim is actually at the inside nav station, and there is a question about Perfect. how that performs at night. Okay, oh, yeah. so here we On go. the night watch. <laughs> Kim, demonstrate for us. <laughs> 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 Thomas, I'm in. So, uh, <laughs> go ahead, why don't you sit over there? This, uh, everything dims down to, to night mode. Uh, we've got a 12 inch here and a 16 inch out there, but we can also put the uh, chart plotter on our TV, which is really nice for crew, you know, uh, relaxing in the, the uh, SETI or whatever. So, I mean, um, yeah, as far as uh, night watch, we usually have the, the red light on, giving us, uh, you know, protection from bright lights or whatever. Uh, it's a great setup. Great setup to be out of the weather, and we can see everything that we need to see from here. And what? have you seen our nav station? Have you seen it? Come, yeah, it's come, very come look. pretty. Show, show. I can do the wine. <laughs> Is there wine there? It's beautiful. It's I mean, it's, it's not mine. It's I Sue's, brought my own. It's Sue's wine. It's amazing. What is it? It's very nice. And then if you come oh, back and you can have it. She said that was hers. I'm still working. No, mine's over there. <laughs> <laughs> We're having an argument about so this wine comes in handy they're, quite they're trying a bit. to steal my wine. <laughs> We Sorry, actually, go ahead. We Thomas. actually <laughs> use the television for you know the chart plotter all the time when we're on long passages. Well, it's, it's nice for night watch because yeah. when you're coming up, you know, you're getting your coffee or whatever, and you can kind of ch look at the the chart and understand yeah. what's going on before you even engage in like the you know the turnover report. Um, so it's yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. Well, as anyone that's known that uh, sails a passage, you want to make sure you get up at least once every three hours and make sure there's nothing in front of you. Yeah, at least. Yeah. At least. Well, we generally have well, somebody. We generally have somebody. Yeah, 20 set, 24 set. No, we, we have somebody. Yeah. I was being sarcastic. Yeah, okay. yeah. I hope so. There's always yeah, we generally out. try to have somebody on No, I was, I was teasing. I was teasing. Oh, speaking of. Speaking of teasing, Scott wants to know how large of a wine rack does this boat have? This is, <laughs> well, wine yeah. cellar. Oh, this is an important question, it's Scott. Funny the boat, I'll never get wine is so good. The boat was picked up in South Africa in the city named Nizna, and uh, the exchange rate is doing really well apparently for U.S. to uh, South African uh, currency, and that was filled. Oh, and there's so this was filled with uh, South African wine and liqueurs and things like that. The dog ball is what they drink it out of. <laughs> but that, that was part of the adventure, was seeing the culture over there, you know, and, 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 and these wines, Stellenbosch, Hermanus, Vankensche, all these wine districts that you read on the, the bottles here in America. Oh, yeah. You actually live it, and it's just, uh, it was an amazing uh, experience. And you said uh, uh, meat was a great purchase meat there, too. Yeah, the dollar was so strong, we'd go straight to a butcher, fill up our freezers with uh, filet mignon and smoked pork and things like that. And uh, for the passage, our crew said this is the best day ever ate. <laughs> <laughs> so we were quite happy with it. Mike, one more roller rolling question. Do you, do you have to reap it when you're going upwind? That's a great question because I've, I've heard that too and I don't know if you I'm know that. Just because um, it's windy out there. The question is with a roller furling um, mainsail, a lot of times you have to be going uh, a certain angle to wind to make sure that the tension's off the system so that you can actually reef it. So if you're coming right. up bad weather, do you have to? how much do you have to swing around to get yourself in the right Normally position to be able to drop? Normally we go straight into wind. Um, 45 degrees each each side, mm -hmm. um, but it's quite critical to have your bangs set uh, 
the, the right angle. Right angle. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. But you, yes, definitely it's easier to go into the wind, but there is a method uh, if you're going uh, downwind. downwind. Yes. Can you go pretty much any angle if you have to? Or is uh, again, it much? You, you want to try to get as less powered, you know, you want to depower it for whether you raise or lower it. And then, but, uh, I was just going to say that this might be a follow up to, I don't know who asked the question, but there was someone that had posted a comment of, how does that work if you're in bad situations, all of a sudden a storm cell comes mm -hmm. up on you and you don't notice and you don't want to turn the boat around and maybe go into the waves. Um, can you do it or you pretty much have to? Because that's, you know, one thing you can at least do with a regular sail, you can, you can reef it at any. I guess you can. It's probably not as. It's probably really hard though. Still, you still want to take the power out of the main. Well, I, well, if you have your traditional, you know, reef, free reef points, you definitely want to go to weather, minimize the load off the main. Obviously, yeah, make it nice and clean. Because we're dealing with reef lines, reef points. Now you're dealing with angles mm -hmm. of the lines when they're coming off the blocks from the boom back back into the boom and into to the homes. So you want to make sure that there's no funkiness between your blocks where you set your reef because really easily chafe through a reef line if the angles aren't right. Mm. With the boom roller furling, you've eliminated that, like Thomas said. You can do some reefing downwind, but again, if you know you're gonna be in a blow, it's gonna take just a few minutes to go to weather. If, if you pipe it up, turn your engines on, balance out the speed with the wave swell, so you're pretty much in one spot, slowly going with the waves. Put the mainsail where you want it, fall it to wind and go. Okay, so like most people say, reef early. Yeah, yes, sure. Exactly. And again, with the in-boom roller furling, um, wherever there is a, a in-boom batten, you can actually take the sail down to that point. So essentially, this boat, you consider this boat could have six free points. Okay. We've got six marked on the sail. Yeah, yeah so six batten. Yeah. And every batten, they, la they labeled one, two, three, and so on. And uh, yeah. that's the operation. Now would be a good time to ask any more finance questions. That's true. I had some... All right, the rapid fire. No, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so, <laughs> Amy's here, so we're good. Okay. This, this is She's just going to back up earlier. everything Amy um, told us. Yeah. But can you get financing for a foreign built boat? Yes, um, it's very easy on new boats, and certain, um, I guess it depends on how the flag is, how the owner owns the boat on a brokerage boat will determine whether we can lend against it. Meaning if it's... Uh, so it could be, in, we have a boat in Caraco right now, we have a boat in Panama, we have a boat in... Um, I mean, a couple in Vietnam. So it depends on how the person owns the boat. If it's uh, if it's French flagged or BVI flagged, that's fine. Okay. Or Coast Guard documented. If New boats just, are very easy. If they're just flying a pirate flag, probably really hard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Another pirate flag is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Tough um, to perfect your lean on a pirate vessel. <laughs> so Kim, I just kind of said that you know you kind of have to finance your own boat it, on a new build. You kind of right. have to finance your own boat for the first like until the last payment when the boat is mostly finished right and then the finance company will come in and pay okay, you back, back right up to 20 percent or you right had to, you had to pay right you always have to have at least 20 percent in and some banks require 25 percent of your cash be in the boat if you're going to charter um but we can do other makeshift financing that's like a bridge financing facilities are just unrelated to the boat so uh, it's not true marine construction finance but I've been in banking so long, I have contacts that can do like uh, loan kind asset of thing. based loans, mm -hmm. security, secured business lines, different ways. Or we've done 401k, pension plan administrator, we've spoken to people and put lines in place, and then we can pay everyone back when we get the boat substantially completed, at the builder certificate, and you know, cool. so. Um, all right, so how about uh, boat age was one that came up. If, if, is there a certain age where boat financing becomes more difficult? If it's well, yeah, 10 years is very easy. 20 years, there are, we have about, say we have 20 banks, it'd be like, at 10 years, probably half of those will lend against the boat, or all the banks will lend against 10. But I'll do 20 years, and then beyond that, it's deal by deal. Mm. Um, which some people say DBD means don't bother doing. I'm just saying. <laughs> I did a 1922 um, Canadian warship with a copper bottom, so it can be done. It just takes somebody with some expertise. I think 
having an experienced loan officer when it's an older boat would really make a difference versus just sending your application in online. That's where I would actually call someone and talk about it before you Yeah, buy. if you're putting your 1922 sure. as like, what boat are you trying right. to finance? We've done all kinds of crazy. We just, we just did a Grand Banks that was an eight, it was the year like, you know, Right, say what you're right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that to the public, yeah. right? Exactly. No, well, we've done boats in the early 80s, so we'll leave it at that. I know people mm -hmm. shop around, but um, is is there a problem with with a asking too many people to get insurance for pre or, 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 and pre approval for uh, non financing. insurance financing for you? Because I know that that's been a problem in the past sometimes where. So what I always tell people, that's a great question, Amy. What I always tell people is Soundings Magazine in the back has a section called Boat Locker, and if you're shopping, insurance, or financing, you can get a feel for what the market will bear in the back of Soundings Magazine. I wouldn't send you there if we didn't lead the market in rates. So generally, we have the lowest fixed rates in the country. But um, it's interesting. You can call and shop all you want, but only give your social security number to one person is what I always recommend to people. Because I, I think it's bad, it. right? Because we have uh, competitors that will shotgun an application to 10 or 12 places where we'll pull credit once mm -hmm. and the bank will pull. And then we'll update your approval right prior to the votes being finished. So it's much wiser to limit, especially if you're buying a boat that's older or a boat that's outside the U.S. or a catamaran over 40 feet, like larger transactions probably need a little more expertise than if you were just going to go get something small and quick. So. And Soundings Magazine, is that something local? I haven't heard of that before, so I don't it's know. Just a, um, it's just a, an international periodical. It's like, oh, actually, it's a U.S. periodical, and um, for years people have advertised burning. financing and insurance in the back of it. But um, with insurance, it really matters who you call first. So please mm -hmm. talk to Liz and then call whoever you want. Yeah. With financing, it doesn't matter how many people you talk to. It doesn't matter who pulls your credit, who you give your social to. Um, okay. Great. Um, so this, I ask a similar question to Liz. What's the what's the one most common misconception that people have coming into getting boat financing that you have to hmm. kind of re reset their expectations or? That's set them a straight? good question. It's like a house. Um, I think people think it's more like a car and that it's going to be really easy. And since you need a house to live in and you need a car to get back and forth to work, and a boat is a want and not a need, it's mm -hmm. deemed luxury finance. And so the credit scores on a house or a car are much lower, the requirements, than on a boat. Um, is that across the board, whether it's a lake boat versus a million, two million dollar? It could be a canoe or a kayak or a $32 million mega yacht. It's still going to be the same thing. Like It's definitely a difference. It's considered luxury finance if it's... Um, you know, an RV or a boat or an aircraft. Then mm. Those are the genres that we lend in. So. Yeah. All right. This is an aside because I'm curious. What's the largest financing deal that you've done on a boat? Can you say? Um, that thirty-two million dollars. Why wow. I said that. I figured that wasn't yeah. a random number, which yeah. is what. Well, and you want to hear something interesting? I bring cookies to all these guys. I bring wine. I bring oh wine my gosh! She brings and I ask for goodies. the business of my clients to recommend me to when they're in a raft up or a rendezvous. That deal came from Facebook. Somebody wow. found me on Messenger, and luckily I checked the filter that takes out all the crazy weirdo stalker yeah, people. Yeah. And I looked, and I was like, oh my gosh, the guy found me on Facebook. That's how I found wow. him, so it's very interesting. How about Liz? What's the what's the biggest boat that you've, you've insured? Oh, yeah, I'm not with Kimberly in that department. <laughs> <laughs> she has I'd probably say boat. about $3 million. Oh, still. Yeah. 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 Still. I just keep it there. Yeah. I mean, those mega yachts are complicated. And, yeah, uh, I, can, yeah. I mean, you and, have like and, the crew. And it's a lot of service, updating right. and everything. And right. I like the local people here at the show, and that's really my resource. That's where I get oh, all my deals from. Sure. So you guys are both in Annapolis? Yes. And do you, where do you, what's well, your coverage area? Do you, is that not true? You're not in Annapolis? Um, I was for 25 years. Okay. It's a long story. Okay. <laughs> She's She's the Bahamas in Florida. So, okay. Yeah. But you call you, you would you work with people? So if someone's watching this from wherever, is there a range that they you know that or a region or territory that you guys no, try to stick to? Worldwide. Right. Worldwide. Yeah. Do you call these girls? It's funny, even before COVID, but Liz and I were financing only to US citizens. Well, we can lend to a foreign citizen if they own real estate here or file tax returns, one or the other, and okay. then we can lend generally. So um, is at a sea level of zero or higher then, is what you're Right, saying. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anywhere in the world we can lend to any Kim, can you talk to the viewers about deducting boat expenses? Oh, that's interesting. So I know just enough to be dangerous, and I'll probably be misquoted, or I'll probably misspeak. So. Okay, so we'll, we'll start with a disclaimer. This is to the best of Kim's knowledge. <laughs> right, and, you're, and I'm supposed to say, your consult your tax advisor. Yeah. Having yeah. said that, 
by and large in the last two or three years, and I think Liz would back me up, boat sales, one of the reasons they're up so high in COVID is that people are starting to take advantage of accelerated depreciation on their yachts or deducting the interest. There are various different ways to qualify, and if I spoke to you or looked at your application, I could pretty much tell you and then speak to your accountant and work with them on it. But it's people that would have paid cash, Typically at the show, no, 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 I, sweetie, I pay cash for all my toys. Literally to the day, like two or three weeks later, they call back, tail between their legs. My accountant said I need to talk to you. I'm buying a $3 million boat, but I have to borrow at least 500000 That's where my tax advantage stops. Wow. So it's interesting. It's different for each person. But if that law ever changes, it'll be like another, you know, back in the Reagan years, they tried to take, love to do the luxury tax, and it would be catastrophic. But the tax advantages are wide, you know, widespread. I think it's another I think reason to talk to someone that knows what they're doing when it comes yeah. to this stuff. Yeah, yeah, we so have a great person too. We, we have the, the A-team rates here, Mike. Low, yeah, we have the A-team So maybe here. better than you'd be making on your some of your best. Right, rates. right. We so. have rates in the I'll say fours, but I'm pretty certain I could get you threes if you were wow. if your boat were done today and able to, you were able to take delivery. Wow. So think about it. If you're the average Americans in the 22% tax bracket, and if you're paying. Say to just to be conservative, you're paying four percent for your money. Well, right now you're, that means you're paying, by and large, like three point six. Because you you're taking twenty-two percent off of that. Right, you're taking tax. your okay. you're deducting. So I mean, the tax-effective rates are really low, and you could leave, you could have your money perform better for you in a mutual fund. In a mutual fund, or even in T. Rowe Price Grandma, you know, Prime Reserve Grandmother Fund, you could yeah. still earn more than you're paying me in your on your loans. Yeah. So this Crazy. is the reason why you say That's why your we're money more is and use my money. Yeah. Right. Right, you're paying cash. Okay, what about yeah. debt to income ratios for qualifying for a loan? What what kind of ratio are you looking at? I think they're pretty lenient. I think they're more lenient now than they've been in my career. Um, we have a lot of latitude. If you think about it, if you earn a hundred thousand and your debt ratio is fifty percent, right? You only have fifty grand in disposable income remaining. But if you make a million dollars and you're at fifty percent, you have five hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So the debt ratio is relative to the tax bracket that you're in. So Fortunately or unfortunately, um, income-producing families or wealthier clients have a much higher threshold for tolerance for debt ratio. So. It got really windy out all of a sudden, so I closed yeah, this, yeah. this yeah. door, the double door here is now closed, because all we were hearing was, I think they were starting to reef some of the banners. I think that's kind of interesting, because I haven't seen this closed yet, so that's kind of actually... And there's cool thing a little lock points here, right? This this latch can go down and you can fix it at different uh, openings. The top. Oh, the yeah. top one? Top like you have 10% battery left. Okay. To see. Any other questions? We that. should also thank Scott and Jack and Ray and Robin and Star and all the people yeah. that Yeah, asked thank questions. you for logging in yeah, and asking questions. We weren't sure if this would just be a bunch of canned questions that people could refer back to later because no one was actually watching. <laughs> um, so I appreciate you showing up and engaging. We had at least five people watching. Yeah, that's <laughs> Uh, and this will be up there if you want to refer back to it. And if you think of any questions afterwards, please uh, reach out, comments, um, and we'll answer all of those. Um, if there's other questions, we're certainly not needing to wrap up, but um, just want to take the moment to thank everyone. Um, Tom, Tommy, Amy from Sailaway Catamarans for inviting us up again. Thomas and Terry for inviting us under their floating into their floating home yet again. Oh, Marina was watching. She says, "Great, thank you." <laughs> Hi, Marina. <laughs> and then we have uh, Kim from New Coast. New Coast Financial. And uh, I'm not even going to try to. Liz Childs. Liz Childs. From Liz Childs from. Mark's Marine Insurance. Mark. Insuretheboat.com. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm sure people will have questions and follow-up questions, and um, so uh, I will definitely put the information at the bottom of this, um, and you'll have access to them. And I think that's pretty much it. Any other last remaining questions? We've got questions? lots of thanks and great and job and so. smiley faces. Oh, well, good. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And um, we're going to be here um, through the weekend with our friends. Well, actually, through Saturday. So if you think of something like, oh, I wish I would have asked such and such, let us know. We'll, we'll put it in the next video. We'll record it, and we'll come back, and we'll record it and put it into the next video so you guys can get those answered as well. So it's not a speak now or forever hold your peace. It's let us know if you think of something later. Michael, and can I say one more thing? Absolutely. So one of the things that distinguishes Sail Away Catamarans, and I do not work for them. I work for a bank um, or for a finance company. What distinguishes them is you were selling a lifestyle, it's not a boat. And so I joked with Thomas and Terry a couple of years ago when they were looking at RVs and ended up buying this, um, that you know you guys are gonna be wearing 
yacht broker shirts and talking to people and selling things. So I think that's one of the things that distinguishes this group is we all went to high school together and lots of us, have, we've known Liz for 30 years and it's one stop shopping. Any question you have, if we don't know the answer, we'll put you onto a tax advisor. We have a guy who's been phenomenal and uh, so I just wanted to that's mention great. that last thing. Thank you, Kim. Sure, it's true. Mm -hmm. it's a family. All right, so from everybody here on Contiki, thank you for tuning in. Thank you. And thank, you for <laughs> thank you for joining. All right, take care. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Well done. And now See I gotta find how to stop it. Hold on one second. Oh, there it is.